Hey, this is Andy Jenkins for YL Summit. And Barney had reached out to me and asked me if I would share this year with you guys. And I, I think I've done this for, goodness, it's been several years in a row now. And this one, I wanna take a little bit different approach. Um, this is a borrowed office. This isn't, this isn't my office. I actually office out of the house. And lately I've been doing some work for a nonprofit. The name is Crosswinds. And what they do is they were started, I'm a friend of the founders, they were started a couple years ago uh, really to intersect faith and culture and really kind of be at the forefront of that. And they thought that rather than arguing against people, it might be better if we have a conversation about faith and they're a Christian organization kind of in the public sphere and, and really kind of take on some of the more important topics of the day and see what we can do. Um, how, how would faith respond to these? How would uh, the message of Jesus and the gospel of grace impact these? And so a couple years ago, um, this will give you an example of really kind of their approach. What they did is they took on this idea of veterans coming back from war with PTSD. This was a topic that kept coming up over and over in conversations in the public sphere where they were involved in some political things. And so really, the more they were involved in politics, the more they saw war, and the more they saw war, the more they saw this interaction of soldiers that had these deep, emotional, invisible scars. And so that led to a documentary. And then that documentary, extremely well received, led to another documentary. And then that documentary has led to uh, really working on a script for a feature film. And this is the bigger one. They've given away so many of these documentaries. They make them free of charge to veterans and or their families. And they've given away so many that that's led to more conversations with even more veterans uh, who are suffering, struggling with PTSD and or their family members. And you might not know the stats on that, that 22 veterans a day commit suicide. Uh, so statistically speaking, more veterans have died since September 11th, 2001. More soldiers have died at their own hands, suicide, rather than dying in war, which kind of to put that in perspective, you're more likely, if you're a soldier, to survive the battlefront than you are to survive the home front. That, that'll put that in perspective. And there's probably more that die of suicide that we don't record as suicide um, just because they, they, they might die of natural causes, but it was something that was precipitated by really just trying to kind of end it, if, if that makes sense. Um, so it's, a, it's an extremely high number. Emotional hurts is an extremely big issue. And I'll be honest with you, this is one, not the PTSD uh, on par with the soldiers, but man, the last several years have really just flipped us upside down. And this is an area where I've really struggled. And somebody always told me, they said, you know, if you want to see the area where the Lord has called you or he's going to use you the most, it might be the area the enemy has gone after the most, where he has tried to pummel you and attack you. And so recently, one of the things that Crosswinds has done is starting these small groups from all these conversations that have happened about PTSD in the films and starting some small support groups, um, kind of like 12-step groups, but not really. And we're actually writing a curriculum for that. I can show it to you. Um, this is kind of the rough draft. So I've been working on, on that. And this is this would be a book that's out, uh, I think, in January. I'm actually teaching it. It's a 10, 12 lesson thing. We're teaching two lessons at a time with this pilot group. And man, it's, it's been an incredible opportunity um, to meet with some amazing men and women that have served our country well, that have walked through just some incredible, deep battlefront overseas, but also deep, just wounds on this side. And they've been so transparent and so uh, gracious really to invite us into their story. And so I've been working on kind of out of my story, some things intersect with their story to pull that together and hopefully empower and help a whole bunch of people. And so I want to talk to you today about emotions and about emotional health. And I'm not going to get a lot into essential oils. That is something that I do use as support for that. And we can put links and text and all of that where you can just kind of spring off and find. I even taught a class on that, just how to use emotions uh, or how to use essential oils for emotional support. Uh, and so I'll put a link down below where you can get that. But really just kind of want to open up, maybe maybe the idea today is on this video, is just to say, hey, this is a real area and it's an important area and it's an area that we don't have to look at. And so um, I, I want to give you a couple of reasons to look at. And so, you know, I was recording this and Barney reached out to me and said, hey, give me, give me three talking points. So let me give you those talking points really quickly. I'm just gonna kind of enumerate them and then I'm gonna talk you through them. And again, 
to, to kind of take the next step, we'll put a link and you can kind of go get the free video series that's, that's there that we'll make available to you. So here's, here's the three main points. These are kind of long, and if, if you've ever heard me talk in public, you know, I kind of just usually talk with one idea. Um, but the advantage of this is I'm not about to walk off the stage and then hope that you remember this and have to have you remember it because I won't talk to you again. With this one, I would encourage you to kind of review and come back and rewind and really kind of see what's here so that you can make the most sense and get the most help from it. All right, so here's, here's the idea. Number, number one is emotional health is a vital component of total health. Okay, emotional health is a vital component of total health, yet it's one that we often overlook, um, particularly for ourselves. We may even be unaware of it, but we may even be unaware that there are emotional issues. Number two, um, spiritual health often masks emotional unhealth. Um, because it looks so close, um, if you look at spiritually, people just assume that you're emotionally whole, and you might not be. In fact, the more spiritual you look, the more destructive emotional you might actually be. Um, we'll come back to that. Number three, there aren't bad emotions and good emotions. Okay, there aren't bad emotions on one side, good emotions on the other side. They're just healthy and unhealthy expressions of them all. And once you learn that your emotions are thermometers, not thermostats, a thermometer, when you walk into the room, a thermometer, we'll come back to this, a thermometer tells you the temperature of what's going on in the environment, and then you can use the thermostat to control that environment. The, the thermometer is necessary because it says, hey, here's what's going on. Hey, if you go outside and you look at the thermometer and you go outside without looking at it, you, you might get too cold or you might get too, get too hot or you might, so our emotions are like that. They tell us what's going on, not to control us, but so that we can, we can deal with it. So we can, can deal with the issue. Okay. You're better suited to deal with reality or emotions are not thermostats that set the temperature. They just read it. And so that, that's really the big, big ideas I want to talk to you about. Now, let me tell you kind of how I got into this. Um, back this year at the beginning of the year, I was running, I was in Cancun, New Mexico, going on a trip and Christy and I were down there, went for a uh, eight or 10 mile run and I was listening to Audible, audio book on here of a book I'd read the previous year. The previous year had been really difficult and I was rewinding and reviewing this book that I'd read the previous year by listening to it while I'm running, uh, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality by Peter Scazzaro. I'll put the link here too. Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. And in that book, Peter Scazzaro, he was a pastor that was in his mid fifties and he just crashed. And he crashed emotionally and kind of had to start rebuilding everything in his life. And he goes on and says this. He says, emotional wounds aren't so obvious. That was kind of one of the first points that I made here. Yet they're a part of total health. And he reminds us of this. And he, he says this in a gracious way. He says that we are multifaceted people. And when you see someone that has a physical he says this in such gracious, gracious language, but if they have a physical uh, handicap or defect or wound, um, it, it could be any of that. He said, we, we kind of see that. It's obvious to notice and it's owned by the person. Those two points are important. It's obvious and it's owned. And so as a result, we kind of make concessions for them and help them. So if somebody rolled into this office <clears throat> right now and had a wheelchair, you know, I would get up, I would move some chairs out of the way and make sure they could get where they needed to go. If they walked in and they had, you know, a, a dinged up arm, had a sling on and there was something heavy they needed to get, I would, I would take it, I would help them. If they walked in, they were blind, they couldn't see, you know, they had a cane, I would start navigating and saying, hey, watch out for this, watch out for that. Let me help you. Let me you know, because physical health, we realize that's important. And if somebody goes and gets, somebody walked in, you know, to a small group meeting or something that you're in and said, hey, I realize I'm a little bit overweight and I'm going to go lose weight. I'm going to go hire a physical trainer. And we would applaud that. We would look at that and say, great, great for you. Okay. Same thing's true of intellectual health. If somebody walked into this room and they had an intellectual issue, a mental issue, uh, Alzheimer's, uh, if they had Tourette's, if they had anything else that might just a learning disability, if, if they had anything that made them intellectually not up to whatever the, whatever the environment was, th that would probably be obvious and it would be owned. And so we would help them. We, we don't look at people who have Alzheimer's and brush them away. We, we make concessions. I mean, we go out of our way to help them. Um, and so this is another thing that Peter Scazzaro says in that book. He goes on and he says, if somebody has spiritual questions and if they're seeking the deep truths of life, you know, sometimes those things are obvious. People kind of broadcast that through their questions. And so we go out of our way to make concessions and to kind of help them and bring them in. If they're having relational issues and relationally, they're just 
either they're struggling relationally in a close relationship with a marriage or a friendship or at work or relationally, man, they're just awkward. Like, like everybody has kind of that awkward person in their family. He said, same thing. We, we kind of see that and we work with people on that. And, and he says, this is because we're multifaceted people and we realize that all these areas are important. So here's the problem. Emotional health, emotional health is just as vital. It's just as important, but emotional health, it often goes, it often goes unnoticed. It's not obvious. Uh, if you say the right words, if you look presentable, if you're physically in good shape, if you, you know, clean up well, if you, especially if you look spiritual, if, if you can pray the right prayers and if you can confess the right things, this is a lot of times these emotional things can just go under the surface. Now they still affect everybody around you. If you're a controller, you're still going to control people. If you're, you know, have some codependent tendencies and you really need affirmation from other people, you're still going to do that. If you uh, still have angry outbursts, you've got a short temper and you've not dealt with that. Like you're still going to do that. If you uh, manipulate and try to, you know, you're still going to do that. If you, you know, you, you kind of fill in the blanks. You've seen people that have had emotional wounds before. If you have those, you're still going to have those. But like people may give you the benefit of the doubt on that. Like they may just kind of overlook it for a while because everything else looks so good. Yet th this is still, it could still be a huge issue. It could still be, um, it could still be quite, quite destructive. I'm realizing that your total health, my total health, it's almost like the, a chain and a chain, uh, a chain is only as strong as the weakest link. It doesn't matter how, how strong and elaborate all the other links are. You know, if the physical link of your chain is really robust and if the intellectual chain uh, or link of your chain is really robust, but you've got a really flimsy one in the middle that's your emotions. That one is going to control your ultimate destiny. I mean, we know this with health at all the time. You know, people that have an amazing call in their life, they're intellectually smart. Goodness, they're spiritually on fire. They're vibrant. They're emotionally stout and strong, and they know all sorts of things. And there's this, again, tremendous call in their life. But you know that physically, they're not in great shape. They've not taken care of themselves. And at some point, like, that's going to that's gonna come due. And at some point, 60s, 70s, their health may just crank out, tap out, yet they may have 20 or 30 more years of calling of uh, incredible things they could still do, but they can't because that weak link has snapped. It's held them back. And this is what's true about emotional health. And so what I'm saying is like, if there's emotions that need to be dealt with, or if there's an emotional issue that needs to be dealt with, that's something that's really got to be put before the Lord. It's really got to be put before you, honestly, also really put before people that you're walking with transparently that have the right to speak into your life. The, the issue with so many issues that we have is so often they're, they're not well, let's say it this way. We have blind spots in our life. And as we're coasting through life, it's easy, super easy, not, not to see what's true about us uh, or, or it's true that we so often grade ourselves not just on the curve in the good way but we throw ourselves under the bus on the bad way now, if you got emotional issues you probably throw yourself the good way um, let me give you an example of what i mean years ago when i was in college i was in phenomenal physical condition and i remember we were flipping through this book and it was about weightlifting and i'm trying to learn about weightlifting again not to be like all stout and strong but like to be just kind of lean and fit and I remember flipping through this book and I finally told my brother and this girl I was dating at the time, I was like, I want to look like that. Like this guy's in phenomenal condition. And there, there in the book was this guy that was, you know, five years older than me and he was just in really good shape. And in the book, he's like teaching people how to work out and how, and how to be in shape and how to get lean and how to, you know, have abs and have, you know, cuts in your muscles that you can see all these sorts of things. And I told him, I was like, I want to look like that. And my brother, and again, this girl, they look at me and they say, you, you actually do look like that. Like, that's what you look like. And here's the deal. I, I couldn't see it. I, I was grading myself down. It was a blind spot. It works the other way, too. I remember I told some of you my story four or five years ago. I was 50 pounds heavier than I am now. And I didn't see it. I mean, I, I was going and buying new clothes every couple months and having to get bigger pants and, you know, expand the waistline. And it was, I mean, bigger shirts. And I would try on shirts that I thought used to be the size that I wore. You know, I'd try on a, used to wear a medium. I wear a medium now. I'd try, try on large. 
enlarge wouldn't fit. I have to go up to XL. I try on pants that it used to fit, then pants that were even bigger than what used to fit, and I'd have to get an even bigger size. And I couldn't see it in myself that I was gaining weight until finally one day on a trip to Hawaii, stepped out of the shower, looked in the mirror, and I was like, man, I probably need to lose a little bit of weight, a little, and asked my wife. And then after she told me and was honest with me, I realized I needed to lose way more than what I thought I needed to lose. And so we all have these blind spots. And one of the keys is to walk with people who are wise, who know, who know you well, who know all of you well, and have the right to speak into your life. So often, I, th I think for the last um, year, I've been walking very transparently with several men, and there's nothing going on with me that they don't know. Um, there's nothing that if you found out and you called them and said, Hey, did you know that he, no matter how bad it was that they wouldn't already know. And as a result of that, they're able to speak into my life because I know they've got my back and they're able to bring some correction. And they're also able to say, Hey, wait, no, no, you're actually seeing this one, right? Keep walking forward. And we need that. And you need to foster those relationships now before there's this big emotional turmoil. Uh, so often when you're in the midst of emotional turmoil, it's difficult to see reality and see what's going on around you. Kind of like me being in shape or me not being in shape. I couldn't see it either way because I was too blinded by the familiarity of it. And it's important that you have people that are in your life that can speak truth to you in the situation, regardless of what that situation is. Um, I know a lot of people that think that they have close friends, think. And when you look in the measure of scripture, uh, scripture says as iron sharpens iron, so the countenance of one man sharpens another. Well, iron, and iron don't really sharpen each other just by, oh, nice, kind of cut off. Like it's, it's tension that brings that sharpening in to be. Uh, Proverbs says, faithful are the wounds of a friend. That means a friend can tell you the things that you don't want to hear. And so, and you need those relationships. If, if you always have people that are telling you exactly what you want to hear and not what you need to hear, you're going to be blind to the emotional stuff, no matter how good you look spiritually. Um, this would be true too if you have relationships. I know people that have very close friendships, they think, um, but then when you push them a little bit, those friends will say, I don't have the relational ability, like our relationship doesn't have the ability to where I can speak into that person's life. And that, that means that it's not really a friendship. It is an acquaintanceship, or it may be somewhere between an acquaintanceship and a friendship, but it's not, really, it's not really a friendship. If somebody doesn't have the relational ability to speak into your life, and if they don't think that you'll hear them, and sometimes you, you got to ask them. you got to say, hey, are you really telling me what you think I want to hear? Are you, telling me, are you telling me what I really need to hear? Are you afraid that I'm going to cut you off and be angry if you go on with this? Like, at that point, like once they feel safe, they'll let you know. But it's super important, it's super important to get those right on the front end. Now, here's what I've seen is so often, and this is kind of number three here, is there aren't good emotions and there aren't bad emotions. Um, I think growing up, I had this idea that emotions couldn't be trusted. And when I grew up, I was in the church and they had this, it was a, it was a gospel tract. And the gospel tract had a train, it had a locomotive, and it had the locomotive labeled as facts. And then it had the coal car labeled as faith. And then it had the caboose labeled as feelings. So it was fact, faith, and feelings. And the guy that was writing a gospel track, um, and a gospel track is just like a brochure to help people come to faith, you know, and follow Jesus. And so the track said this. It said facts are what is important. Like facts are the thing that drives your life. And so you got to believe the facts. And they're talking about the facts of the Bible. Faith is the thing that throws fire on those facts, like the coal car, but the facts are what drive it. The facts are the driver. And the feelings, man, that train will run with or without the caboose. You, you don't have to have the feelings. And what they were saying was, hey, every day you're not going to walk up and feel like your spiritual life is on fire. That's what I think they meant. But kind of what I took from it was like, oh, we don't need the feelings. And, and in fact, kind of, it was, I grew up Baptist. And in Baptist world, like the facts were ultra important. And we were told that feelings couldn't be trusted. You know, feelings could lead you astray. Feelings could deceive you. And, and there, there is some truth to that. Like Jeremiah, the book of Jeremiah says, the heart is deceitful beyond all things. Like who, who can trust it, right? And you see that, but then you see the tension in Scripture where it says that Jesus is going to give you a new heart. He's going to take the old heart. He's going to take it out. This is in the book of Jeremiah and in the book of Ezekiel. He's going to take the heart of 
of stone out and put a heart of flesh in, there'll be a heart conformed to him, okay, to where you can delight yourself in the Lord, as Psalm says, and he'll give you the desires of your heart. And that works really well when you've got people that you trust that are walking with you that can help you. Okay. Proverbs also says, guard your heart. It is the wellspring of life. Now, not guard it like seclude it, like lock it away, but somehow, hey, make sure that you protect it from things that would harm it and damage it so that you can put your heart before the Lord. So you can put your heart out there with close friends. You can put your heart out there really to kind of understand and navigate as you walk through life. Okay. Jesus says that everything that we do is an overflow of the heart that's inside of us. Uh, one day the Pharisees got mad at the disciples. They looked at the disciples and said, man, why in the world are these guys, uh, they're, they're eating and drinking without washing their hands. And what, what they really meant at that time is it's, it, it, it's not this idea that the disciples were, were just nasty because they weren't washing their hands. What they really meant was they weren't washing their hands in a ritual way. There was a ritualistic way that Jewish men and women would wash their hands before they ate. It was part of their religious code. And the Pharisees were kind of, calling them out because they weren't following one of the religious rules. And Jesus says, wait, you can, hold on. You're thinking that religious things are going to make you clean and acceptable. You're thinking that religious stuff is like kind of where it's at, that all these hoops that you jump through are what make you acceptable before God and what really reconnects you to each other. In fact, here, here let's call that word religion, uh, religio. It means to reconnect. That That's what, that's so people say, well, religion's bad. I get what they mean, like with the rules and the legalism and all that. Religion is reconnecting us to God is what that word means, religio, Latin, and reconnecting us to each other. And, and man, that's exactly what Jesus came to do was to reconnect us to our Heavenly Father, to show us what he's like so that all that would be reconciled and to reconcile all things, including human relationships, to restore all things. And so th they're kind of missing the point that that's what Christ came to do. And they're looking at religion as rules, regulations. Why aren't your disciples following the rules and regulations? And Jesus says, wait, it's not, it's not what goes into a man from out there, like washing hands before you eat and then a dirty cup, it's my coffee cup, or a dirty pitcher, a dirty bowl, or dirty utensils, like, and the food that goes in. Like, that's, that's not what makes you unclean. What makes you unclean is the things that come out. Because then he goes on, lying, cheating, fornications, adultery, murder, licentiousness, covetousness. I mean, you just list the list. And some of those are like the big heavy hitters that we think of as like the big sins. And some of those are the ones that are like, oh, those are okay. They're all destructive. And he says, hey, these all, all these come from out of the heart and defile a man. And so, again, he's talking about like the importance of the heart right there. And so, yes, feelings like that caboose could totally lead you astray. So it, it needs to be attached to facts. I heard a preacher the other day say that <laughs> the, the, the Lord d d doesn't put a primary place on theology um, and that thinking is overrated. And, and I think nothing can be further from the truth because even in that, he was thinking a new theology. Like he had, he had thought a theology that was based on experience. It's not, it's not, that, it's not that thinking and facts are bad. Every day we're kind of living out of the facts. We kind of pick and choose kind of how we interpret those. And faith, we all have faith in something. Feelings, all these are important is what I'm getting at. Like it's, it's back to that chain thing to where, you know, God gave you your intellect. First Corinthians 2 says that you have the mind of Christ. So we don't just throw away the locomotive. That word, the mind of Christ, is actually imagination. So if you, you think about that, like it's not just – facts and figures. It's like a mind that is so much more open. It's like when Paul says in Ephesians 3 that he can do immeasurably more above we can all ask, think, or imagine. Like it's just expanded. So the mind's important. Faith has got to be placed in something. Like our trust is a relational thing with our Heavenly Father and with each other. And those feelings are super important. And, and Jesus was kind of calling to, to it, to that, that Everything we do out there is really an overflow of what's going on inside of here, okay, inside of, inside of the heart. It's, it's all, everything out there is, is really just the absolute overflow of what's going on in here. And again, what I would say is, is as it comes out, there, that means there's not bad emotions and good emotions. Growing up, I think I had a, a list of bad ones and I had a list of good ones. What I'm seeing more and more is that, hey, these are all just emotions, 
These are all just our way of encountering the world and the world telling us, hey, here's what's going on in this environment, here's what's going on in this climate, so that then we can read that, we can take our heart. Again, the, the emotions are the, the thermometer, not the thermostat, it, not to control us, but so that we can take them and say, hey, okay, here's what's going on, what do I need to know? As you set your heart before the Lord, set your heart before yourself, and you really look at with prayer, meditation, with scripture, to get healing, to get insight, to get wholeness, and, and to move forward, okay? Does, does, hopefully that makes sense to you. Now, as a result, we see all of the emotions on the good side and the bad side in the life of Jesus. Um, and, and this, this is going to be, I'm going to give you some examples. And this is what Solomon even meant. Why is this guy that ever lived when he said there's a time for everything, a time for every season under heaven, a time, there's time for joy, there's time for sadness, okay? There's time for mourning, there's time for dancing. And what he's saying is all of these are ordained by God. All of these, there's a time for all of these to, to be part of your life experience. And so when, when we look in the Gospels, when we open up the first four books of the New Testament, we actually see Jesus experiencing all of these. In fact, I've got a list right here. Is The scripture says that he wept multiple times. He wept, including like at Lazarus' tomb. He wept in John eleven thirty five. 35, Jesus wept. Um, but also at times, like when he looks at Jerusalem and says, Jerusalem, and he weeps and says, I wanted to gather you to gather and protect you. Because he, he knows that they're going to be doomed, like they're going to be invaded. And he says, I wanted to gather you together, like as a mother hen gathers her chicks, but you wouldn't let me. You kept stoning the prophets, and I kept sending people to you, and you kept pushing them away. And, and he really breaks down over the condition of the people there. And of what's going to happen to them. Um, we read that he became angry on several occasions. Okay, He overturned the tables of the money changers in the temple um, after taking time to really kind of get a whip and uh, those sorts of things. Um, we see that he expressed indignation when the disciples kind of brushed the little children away from him. He said, no, no, let the children come to me. I mean, this is anger and this is indignation. Now, I would say, since we know that Jesus always reveals the far, heart of the Father, and since we know that God's probably not going to walk in here and just start flipping stuff, like we have this idea that the anger of Jesus would be, would look exactly like my anger or would look like your anger. Um, and it would be just like this. And I'm, the more and more I read this and the more I see, hey, there aren't bad emotions, there aren't good emotions. We know that Jesus expresses the heart of the Father purely. And we know that he completely loves all people. God is love. So we know that, which by the way is an emotion, right? God is like emotive. Okay, so if we know that, that means when he's angry with the money changers and he's angry when the Pharisees are questioning him and he, about rebuking him for healing people on the Sabbath, that means he's going to express that anger in a way that is tender, that is compassionate, that is redemptive, and that is restorative. So I, I, don't, I don't think, like, I think our movies may have it wrong when they show a Jesus that's mad that walks in like flipping tables in haste. I'm not so sure that he didn't walk in and get the money and brush it off to the side in his anger and get it and hand it back to the money changers and tell them, this is not how we do this. You know, our heavenly father made this for a house of prayer for all nations so all people can approach him. And I'm not so sure that he didn't get the tables and then just gently lay them over, right? Kids would be afraid of, of a man who was angry. Um, prostitutes would be afraid of a man who was angry in our sense, but, but this is a man that people flocked to. And so he's expressing these emotions. They're not controlling him. They are the thermometer of what's going on. And he takes them in, he puts his heart before the Lord and then he expresses them in a healthy way. Um, the scripture says that he was distressed. Um, the scripture says he was moved with compassion. Like when he sees the 5,000 people that have come there and they've listened to him for several days, it says he's moved with compassion for them. And that word in the Greek language is like this deep gut inside just the stomach. Like it's just this, mm, it's, you know, it's, it's more like this, not angst. It's just more like this deep, your heart is just from the center of everything you have. Like that's, it's a deep emotion. Um, we, we read that and when he was in the garden of Gethsemane, he was sorrowful, unto death like he was that broken and weeping to where he even sweats drops of blood and medical practitioners will tell you that there's actually a medical condition where there is such grief and anguish that the blood vessels beneath the skin pop and start coming out of the pores of your skin and so this is exactly what's what's happening um we read now like peter second peter three 
uh, when Peter's talking in 2 Peter 3, 9 about the second coming, and when's Jesus coming back? It said that he lingers even now because he's patient and he doesn't want anyone to go to death, but he wants all to come to eternal life. And so there's this patience that's in him. So what I'm saying is what we do see in Jesus, a man who is full of joy of the Holy Spirit. We do see him, him, him laughing. We do see, and there, thankfully there's some paintings that, you know, you see like in churches now that aren't so stoic, like stoic Jesus. Like, I mean, there he's smiling. And, and I, and I think that's accurate. Like that's a reflection of who our heavenly father is, which means that's exactly who Jesus is because he's the mirror image of the invisible God. And Jesus is the mirror image of what we're called to be like second Corinthians three, Eight and following says that we, with like with unveiled faces, are being transformed as if looking into a mirror into his exact image. And he had all of these emotions. He had them all, but he learned to express them in healthy ways. Okay, so he's intellectually strong. He's and he, he grew in that. Physically strong. He's wise. Um, relationally, he's strong. Like just Luke 252, it kind of encapsulates all of those. Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. And we see also this intellectual, I mean, this relational, emotional thing where he's using all of these in a very healthy way. Um, Now, because of this, a couple things I want to read you here, kind of as I'm maybe rounding it off to sign off. Um, There's a, a, a Bible teacher that I read, Leaf. Hetland read him this past fall, and he says this. He says, I often ask God to share his emotions with me because I know that he is an emotional, emotional God. He's full of compassion, joy, and many other feelings. And so he, he says that when he prays, he's asking the Lord, hey, what do you feel, not, not just what's true about the situation intellectually, but also what do you feel? And if I know what the Father feels, man, that helps me better relate to my situation because sometimes the Lord's broken over what we're going through. Um, it helps me know what the Lord feels about other people to where I can empathize and connect with them. Sometimes because it's joy, because Paul says we rejoice with those who rejoice. We also weep with those who weep. He says that. And so, again, here's a Bible teacher saying, hey, sometimes I just... I ask the Lord to put forth his emotions to me. Um, and, and I think this is vital because, you know, we're created in God's image. And since we're created in his image, it would mean that we would be able to feel and express what he felt and express. And the more we walk in line with our total redemption, the more we would be able to express all of that in healthy ways, in glorious ways, in in redeemed ways. Um, let me find some more things that I want to show you here. Um, there's another great one. Um, Brennan Manning, he says this, and this kind of relates to what I was saying. And I, it, this is an incredible book, Abba's Child. He says, whether positive or negative, feelings put us in touch with our true selves. Okay, your feelings going to tell you, hey, here's what's going on inside. They put us in touch with our true selves. They're neither good nor bad. They're simply the truth of what's going on within us. And, and I would even add to that. They're the truth of what's going on within us so that we know we can deal with this. A couple of years ago, uh, two quick stories that are really one story. A couple years ago, my son Judah, he fell on a playground at school and he snapped his arm in half, forearm, left arm, just boom. It was loud. It, pro- it popped. It broke. It was obvious. It didn't poke out or anything, but it was just obvious that it was broken. All the kids heard it. The teachers heard it. They called us. They did a magnificent job kind of making up a sling to put on him. And I went up there and I got him and I took him to the hospital. And that night he actually had surgery. They reset the bone. He and I stayed in the hospital overnight. Every time we drive by Children's Hospital, he still looks at it. He goes, hey, that's where we spent the night right there. And again, we knew that there was a wound there because it was just so obvious. The, 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 the arm was just kind of dangling unless we held it together there. Now, about a year after that, we had a zip line in our backyard. We still have it. And our, our youngest daughter, Miriam, I call her Minnie, she was zip lining and she did it two or three times successfully. And then on the last time, she it, like the line hitched and she caught something and she kind of swung forward, back, forward, and then let go and fell and fell maybe five or six feet. When she did it, she got up, she was shaken up, she's crying, went down there, picked her up, held her, and really just decided after interacting with her, let's clean her up. She she had dirt everywhere, dirt on her shoes, dirt in her socks, dirt on her teeth. I mean, it, it was just time, hey, let's just go inside. She was hot, she was sweaty, she just had an accident. Let's take her inside, let her get a bath, 
and let's just see how she's doing after that. And so she tried to wiggle her wrist and all that, and it, it seemed fine. Um, that's what she landed on. Everything else seemed fine. Went up, she got a bath, and after she got the bath, she complained that her wrist was still hurting. Now we kind of let her go in there and take a long bath, and so it was probably 30, 45 minutes, maybe even an hour later, her wrist is still hurting. She's got a little pain in it. And so here's what I did. I gave her some Advil, Christy and I talked, and Christy decided, hey, why don't one of us, she made the, why, why don't one of us take her and get an x-ray on that arm? And so that's what we did. Christy stayed home. I went, one of the girls that had had an arm accident before from gymnastics, we rode down there and we took Miriam and we had a little x-ray film that we had this little fracture. Now, how do we know? We knew because of the physical pain that was going on. The pain wasn't good or bad. The pain was a gift. The pain was to really show us, here's the reality of what's going on. We like to avoid physical pain, but in a real sense, physical pain lets us know, hey, here's, here's what's going on. Here's, here's what you need to know. Um, I, I heard someone last week preach in a sermon, heard it you know, on an audio, and they said something like this. They said, fear is a liar. And, you know, it's on a Christian radio station song too, so it, like it must be true. And I, I think, you know, I, I don't think so. Like, it's wrong to be controlled by fear, and there's an unhealthy expression of fear, but fear is an emotion. And fear is something where we can take it in like all the emotions, anger, and we can put our heart before the Lord on it. Hey, what's going on here? Now, in the Bible, you read stories where they'd have fear. They'd put it before the Lord and the Lord would say, hey, don't be afraid of this army that's coming because I'm going to deliver you. Okay? It's healthy that I'm afraid of walking in the middle of the street. It's healthy that my girls are afraid of going for a walk alone in the middle of the inner city at, at, at night. It's a, it's it's. It, it, it's a good fear that I'm afraid of touching a, uh, putting my hand over the stove when we turn on the pie light and gas it up, right? Like, what I'm saying is, again, it's, it's not that the emotion itself is good or bad. It's the, hey, what do we do with it? I need to, I need to take this in, really figure out from the, from the thermometer what's going around me so that I can, I can put that before the Lord and then I can make an informed decision based on what the Lord's showing me of how to move forward. Okay, does that make sense? And that's, that's really what emotional health is, is not being controlled by your emotions, but, but recognizing the emotions. Several years ago, I went to a counseling session. Uh, I still go see a counselor um, to work through a lot of this stuff and went through a counseling session. I was in a joint one with Christy uh, during this particular one. And the counselor that she met with had this card. It was an eight and a half by 11. This is just a blank sheet of paper. But she put it forward and she said, hey, how are you feeling today? And she handed me this card. And the card had maybe 50 different emotions, kind of grouped logically together on there. And she said, how are you feeling today? And I said, I'm okay. And she said, that's not an emotion. Like, how are you feeling? And I looked at it and I looked through the card. And I was like, man, there are, there are words on here. I recognized all the words but I didn't recognize the emotions. I'd probably experienced them all, but I didn't realize I had. And part of emotional health is recognizing when those things happen to you, when you feel those, and actually feeling them. And realizing that joy and pain, they, they all come into and from the same heart. And we so often want to avoid the one and have the other, but you, but you really can't. You, you can numb your heart and not feel anything but in order to feel the good, you have to be able to feel the bad too. So a part of emotional health is being able to recognize all of those. And then part of emotional health is being able to not be controlled by them, but to then put them before the Lord, put them before yourself, think on them, meditate them, get the truth on them, and then be able to third of all, act on them in a responsible, healthy way. That's all part of emotional wholeness. I read this quote that I want to read you. This is from a girl named Krista Black Gifford. She has this book, Heart Made Whole, which has been really kind of a tremendous thing that I've read during this last season as well. And she says this, you know, and she had dealt with birth defects of a child and then a death of a, of a young child has a tremendous story. And once she started kind of digging on what she was feeling about that, that led her to really dig and go deeper on uh, other things and kind of pull together her whole story. Um, this is what I'm doing. I, I, you know, had some things that came up the beginning of this last year. And instead of just dealing with those issues, going, wait, wait, hold on. This is a trend, like this emotional and health and some of the things are, are a trend. Let me go back and let me, let me kind of pull it all together. And, and I believe the Lord can heal those things in an instant. 
at the same time, I think it's responsible kind of to walk through the store and go, hey, man, I want to navigate this because if I recognize in the past, I can live out and script the story better for the future is, again, I really own what were the feelings that were going on then that I may not even know yet, okay? And then I can go, okay, in the future, I want to recognize these because I don't want to be controlled by them. I want to take them, put them before the Lord, meditate, prayer, scripture, worship, essential oils, whatever it is that's part of my routine, and then I want to live them out in a healthy way, okay, and express myself in a healthy way. I don't want to just flip over the tables of the money changers when I get angry. I want to put that before the Lord and go, how do I do this in a way that is redemptive and restorative and honors and loves people? See, here's what she says. The Hebrew and Greek words for heart are used almost 1,000 times in Scripture, making it the most anthropological term in the Bible. Your heart is such a big deal to God that he writes about it more than anything else, more than sin, more than works, more than obedience, even more than love. And according to God, the heart designed actually determines the course of your life. The Hebrew word for heart is labab, meaning the center of all physical and spiritual life, your core, where your feelings, your will, and your intellect reside. The New Testament word for heart, cardia, it means thoughts or feelings, mind, And it's also defined as the middle. In our modern culture, we've often reduced the heart down to a feeling factory. Now notice that last line. We've wrongly reduced the heart to just a feeling factory. The truth is the heart is intimately connected to all of life. The words we say come out of the heart. The actions that we do come out of the heart. The the motives of things we do come out of the heart. And, And here's... Here's really what I'm saying. Let me, let me land with this. Let me give you the three things that I've kind of told you, and then you can go back and you can, um, goodness, you can kind of put these things together and you can um, re-listen and relearn and take this thing over and over. Here's, here, here's what I sent Barney. Is number one, emotional health is a vital component of total health, yet it's one that we often overlook. Often we don't even see the importance of it in ourselves. I... I know that's been true for me. Maybe, maybe that's been true for you. Number two is spiritual health that often masks as emotional health, but it's not. It can cover up an emotionally unhealthy and destructive pattern. A lot of people get into ministry really for self-worth issues, to cover up for validation. Oh, goodness, like I've, I've done that. And if you look good spiritually, people just assume that you're emotionally healthy and you, you might not be. Okay, that's that's not a condemnation. That's just a, hey, we know that Jesus restores and redeems all things. And so that's just a, hey, um, even if you seem spiritually alert and on fire, still check into this one. And and remember, the way I said to do that was not just to put your heart before the Lord, but to walk now with some people in incredibly close, transparent ways. And if you think you're being transparent, take it a deeper step and ask them, hey, can you really tell me what I need to hear without fear of punishment, retribution, being frozen out, me cutting off the relationship, what, however it is you want to say it, and, and they'll be honest with you. Um, and the reality is that will push the relationship even deeper um, because a lot of us, like we kind of get to this step and there's, I, I've done that for years, and there's so much more depth here. Um, just by way of confession, a close friend of mine, Les Wright, um, he and I were talking about some really deep things last week that I just had put my heart before him on. And he's one of the guys that's been walking with me very closely. And uh, he, he told me, he said, Hey, look, you've actually got this part of this thing, right? I, I didn't know blind spot. He said, you've got this part, right? There's some other things you didn't have, right? But you've got this, right? And I'm, I'm seeing that in you and I'm affirming you in that. And, and somehow in the course of that conversation, he said, you know, we, we've done at this point, we've done eight advances together until number nine, like right around that season is when it just went whole deeper level, right? And there, we were at this depth, but there's, there's more. And to go to that more, you got to be open to sharing transparently and even, even being able to disagree and honor each other in the disagreement. Okay, so number one, emotional health is a component of total health. Number two, spiritually, don't, don't use spiritual health to cover up emotional unhealth. They're both important. Um, number three, there aren't bad emotions and there aren't good emotions. They're all emotions that are all gifted to us by God to be the thermometer of what's going on. And and just like physical pain and physical joy can let us know what's going on with our physical bodies. So can emotional joy and pain be gifts to let us know, Hey, here's, here's an, here's a high to, to be experienced and to enjoy. Here's a low 
to, to redeem. And these are all components that we even see in the life of Jesus of total health. And so emotional health, and again, I'm going to define it. I didn't even have this on my, didn't even have this on my notes. Emotional health, I really think is one, being able to recognize those feelings and being able to recognize them in yourself. And then two, not to react on them, but being able to take them in and really ask the questions of what's going on and take the time before you react. We're at the men's advance. Tom Nicola had this great thing. He said, hey, take 24 hours before losing it, okay? So take the 24-hour rule, and sometimes you don't need that long, but take it and just step back. Don't react in the moment. Step back and really put your heart before the Lord, before meditation, before scripture, before prayer, with essential oils, whatever it is that you need to do, maybe all of the above. What's going on here, and what do I really need to know? What am I experiencing, and what do I really need to know? How do I really need to see this, okay? What are my emotions telling me? And then three, part of emotional health is being able to walk that out in a way that's redemptive, that's whole, that's restorative, that's that's in God's image because that's how you're created is in the image of God. So that's it. As I always sign off on the podcast, I'm gonna sign off in the exact same way on this video here because I know some of you are watching and some of you are just listening. And so my prayers that the Lord blesses you, that He keeps you, that He continues to make His great face of favor shine upon you. And my prayer is that he awakens you to the emotions, to what you're feeling. Not so that you're controlled by them, but that you realize like Jesus did, that these are just part of all that's out there. All, the heart's been created by God and it's been created in a whole way for me to see, to sense, to feel the world around me. Not so that I can react, but so that I can take that before my Heavenly Father, just as Jesus did so much time he got away, so that I can take that before my Heavenly Father. May you do that. May you take it before Him. And may you hear His wisdom and His insight. And may you walk it out in a redemptive way. Grace, peace, and as I always say, shalom. I will talk to you again very soon.